Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hey everybody, I'm Donnie Adair, subbing today for Bruce Broussard, and welcome to Oregon Voters Digest. Hey, Bruce is just taking a little bit of time off to kick back and relax, and I'm really honored that he asked me to come back on and talk with you about a couple of uh, things that are near and dear to my heart. One is, we want to go back and talk about the 30th annual tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King, which was held January 19th at Highland Christian Center and sponsored by Oregon, uh, or pardon me, World Arts Foundation Incorporated. And my guest today is Michael Grice, uh, Michael Chappie Grice, president of Oregon uh, World Arts Foundation Incorporated. Michael, thank you very much for, for joining us today. And we're going to look at some clips that uh, are going to show you the pageantry, uh, all of the great uh, speaking and singing and playing and dancing by d adults and children throughout our community in celebration of the King holiday, his legacy, and what it meant. So we've got this great footage to show you today to actually take you there and let you feel what we felt as this great program took place. Hi, everybody. Happy Martin Luther King Jr. birthday. All right, give him a big round of applause for being here and welcome to the 30th annual Keep Alive the Dream, the celebration of a great American, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. All the wonderful things that he did and the wonderful leadership team that he put together and the wonderful uh, achievements injustice and equality for everybody in this nation. I'm Donnie Adair and it's a pleasure to be back and be your host for the 30th consecutive year. Well, this is a special day. Not only is it a day to celebrate, but it's also a day to honor. We're honored today to be back at Highland Center for our 30th Martin Luther King tribute. Let's give our production team members a big round of applause, please. I want to say a special thank you to John Lampkin, a special thank you to this congregation, and especially a special thank you to Reverend Dr. G.W. Hardy, Jr. We love you, too. Because of that, Michael Chappie Grice, president of World Arts Foundation Incorporated, is going to share with you what we feel is necessary. Because one of the things we say many times that we not only stand on the shoulders of those who have passed on before us, we are standing on the shoulders of those who are among us. And Reverend Dr. Hardy is one of those. We love you, we love you, we love you, Pastor Hardy. We love you, we love you, we love you, Pastor Hardy. We love you, we love you, we love you, Pastor Hardy. We love you. Reverend Hardy has many times preached this verse from 1 Timothy 5 and 17, let the elders that rule be well counted worthy of double honor, especially if they who labor in the word and the doctrine. This is a double honor for he was acknowledged in 2002 and is again acknowledged in 2015. And this particular award from World Arts Foundation Incorporated reads, the 2002 Keep Alive the Dream Lifetime Achievement Award honoree, it is declared and decreed that on Monday, January 19th, 2015, at the 30th anniversary of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Keep Alive the Dream celebration in Portland, Oregon, that Pastor Hardy, Pastor W.G. Hardy Jr., receive this special double honor and recognition with the Love You Shout Out Award. Wow, I'm so honored. It's a privilege 
I'm so used to saying this is Pastor W.G. Hardy Jr., but it seems like you already know who I am and some of what I do. But please know, there's no way I could have accepted or received this award without there being people. I'm here to serve. My life's calling is to serve. Born here in Portland, Oregon, right here in Multnomah County, establishing long-term relationships, seeing the growth of Ken Berry and the World Arts Foundation as they celebrate 30 years of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's incredible. I want you to know that our lives mean nothing unless we give our lives to make better for others. I stand on the shoulders of elders. I stand on the shoulders of my grade school teachers, the people who stood with me, the people who live next door to me. And then I stand not only for those in the past and those in the present, but to collectively, together, we stand for the youth in the future. I believe in what we're doing, and I believe tomorrow will be far greater than today. Again, I say thank you. Hats off. We celebrate every one of us for the greatness of this Lifetime Award. God bless you. Now get ready, because this choir is getting ready to rock em, sock em, and we're going to take it to another level. Let me hear you make some noise, because you are indeed in the right place. This is a celebration. Today is a great day. It's a day that we have a chance to honor Dr. Martin Luther King. Them that's God shall have, them that's not shall lose. Though the Bible says, hand is still is new. You know, I love this celebration, and I do think that Dr. King is here in spirit. Okay, we'll, we'll go back to that in, in a moment and talk about the dignitaries that were there. But, Michael, what did you think about the recap of that first segment? Oh, it's beautiful. It reminds me of, uh, of how we all felt when it was over, uh, that it was a tremendous success that uh, the people who participated in it uh, had as much joy as the people who viewed it. And I, and I think about uh, what is it about the, the program, particularly this year, which was our 30th anniversary, mm -hmm. that really uh, galvanized our effort 
and that was the people. Mm -hmm. uh, both the production team, we had uh, 62 acts that mm -hmm. came on that period of uh, six hours from 12 to noon. It's one of the longest uh, day uh, show tributes that mm -hmm. anywhere in the United States, mm -hmm. excepting perhaps Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, you saw the, the Highland people behind the scenes, and you had our production people behind the scenes, and all kinds of people mm -hmm. uh, on stage, yes. uh, from the mayor to the, uh, the children from one school and children from another school gospel choirs from various churches, big name acts that uh, made a big difference. And of course this year, uh, because we devoted uh, a portion of the program as a tribute to the late and great Linda Hornbuckle mm -hmm. and the incomparable uh, piano impresario mm -hmm. Janice Scroggins, uh, it made it special and yeah. especially uh, because those were musicians who were colleagues of Mr. Ken Berry, our executive producer. Right. In that first segment, one of the things that hit home for me Michael was how many kids in our community got involved and the diversity of those kids. You don't have to be black or uh, a person of color to appreciate the things that uh, Martin Luther King did for this country. And it's great how our whole entire community is embracing him on this particular day. Also, I, we have to thank the school district for its un yielding support of our program uh, and allowing us to go and get the kids in school and school related programs and, and draw them in and let them share with us all this talent that they have. It was Indeed. just tremendous. Well, we always have uh, our superintendent, and this year, Superintendent Carol Smith came in person and delivered a message that was not only appropriate but inspiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, uh, her right hand person, uh, Dr. Harriet Adair, yes. was given uh, a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it was a special award uh, that was crafted. Uh, without her really knowing about it. So mm -hmm. the others kind of knew because they had interviewed and, and she was uh, surprised more or less to... Uh, and to, and to I was honored award. to be a part of that. And I want to thank you and Executive Director Ken Berry, who by the way is over playing at Black History Month and Dr. Martin Luther King celebration at the Vancouver Avenue Baptist Church right now, or he would have been here with us today, but I want to thank him for allowing me to make that presentation. It is not often that you get to make a presentation of that magnitude, especially to a family member, so we appreciate you know, She's that. deserving, and she represents the Portland schools very well, and, and all of them have served us, uh, from the superintendent across the board, her staff have been uh, uh, unequivocal in their support over the years. Okay, so now we've got another segment. Then this first segment, we saw how we got the program off, and we began to, to really ratchet things up by about the second or third hour in the program, and we've got uh, more footage of the 30th annual tribute to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that took place on January 19, 2015 at Highland Christian Center. I've got two minutes. Uh, very quickly, I want to say to you how wonderful and how pleased I am to be in Portland and to be a part of this celebration. As I think back about what Dr. King would say to you today, I would remind you that Dr. King would tell you to get involved. No matter what's going on, no matter how difficult the road might seem to be, get involved. Do not sit around, do not cross your hands, do not talk about how things could be. Be the change that you want to see. A price has been paid for this freedom. Okay, we're back. Uh, as you can see, we had some really good speakers at this event. Now, Dr. J. William Webb, who was speaking there, actually marched in the three marches to Selma. Uh, and so it was great to have someone who was actually there, Michael. Uh, yes, indeed. That authenticates it. Uh, people should know that on March the 8th, mm -hmm. uh, actually on starting on Friday, March the 6th, but on March the 8th, there's going to be a reenactment 
of the uh, bloody Sunday march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. And Selma, Alabama. And there is a delegation of students uh, led by a teacher from Grant High School, and they will be participating in that event also. So it's a, it's a day to focus on, one not to be forgotten, that the rights that we've had, our civil rights, our public accommodation rights, mm -hmm. and especially our voting rights, are, were hard won. And uh, they aren't to be taken lightly. And we can take them for granted now. And uh, history will report that it wasn't easy for us to get it. And without the struggle, uh, we might not have it, even though it's entitled, we're entitled to it as citizens. As a matter of fact, I, I'd like to point to uh, the, the, uh, the breadth of the program this year. Mm -hmm. Because not only did we have our traditional annual and our 30th year of producing uh, Keep Alive the Dream, a tribute to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but we began that morning with a, a, a 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Talk about that program that took we, place that morning. We did something that we had never done before, and it came to us through uh, the offices of one of our uh, very pedestrian uh, laborers in the production team, Mr. J.J. Johnson, who, when we moved it to the annex, because we knew, uh, we learned that there was going to be a lot of people that wouldn't fit in the downstairs where we thought we'd have a little classroom and conduct a seminar. Uh, we moved it to the annex and we uh, took signs and put them all around. Uh, jail, no bail, one man, one vote, uh, freedom now. The very signs that were used during the civil rights movement and the civil rights era and decorated the hall. So when you walked in, you really walked into Selma. And of course, uh, we had just had the release of the film, Selma. And... Uh, and we had on occasion, uh, on that occasion, we had the Honorable Lou Frederick, our state representative. We had the Honorable Avell Gordley, retired um, uh, state senator. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had U.S. Senator Jeff Merkley, mm -hmm. all who participated. Mm -hmm. Olga Acuna, who is a commissioner for Washington County, also sat on the panel. And it was moderated by the esteemed Sharon Gary Smith. Mm -hmm. So it was an experience for our children and some people who were in the audience who actually had marched in the civil rights movement as part of the Freedom Riders mm -hmm. uh, were present. It made it a very special and very small, I mean a very special and, and uh, very appropriate uh, lead in to the Martin Luther King program. One of the guests on the program was Arun Gandhi, mm -hmm. who is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. who Martin Luther King studied mm -hmm. and that's how he accomplished his uh, nonviolent approach to some very difficult issues. And uh, most of us uh, aren't able to turn the cheek, or at least we, it takes a lot of practice it does. To, to turn the other cheek. But he demonstrated, he didn't just preach it, he demonstrated it. And if, when you see that movie, Selma, uh, you will see firsthand what the people sacrifice that we uh, might have the right to vote and, of course, might have the right to all public accommodations and equality, a greater chance at equality uh, in this country. Well, it's a great time for that movie to come out. I've had the privilege of seeing it once, and I think I'll go back and see it again. But it, it is very dramatic, and it is very disturbing in terms of putting you uh, in the moment, so to speak, of uh, all of that brutality and so forth that took place uh, and what our parents and grandparents had to go through and endure for us to be able to sit here and talk on Oregon Voters Digest. Yeah, public television, yes, indeed. And, and uh, uh, share with people the importance of these values. Uh, and also, I want to point out, too, Michael, that we uh, had some dramatic presentations this year. We went back to some of our roots with World Arts Foundation Incorporated uh, and brought back to this program some dramatic presentations. Uh, talk about those a little bit. Well, Val Peterson put together a couple of vignettes, uh, one around Emmett Till and one around the Voting Rights Act that uh, really brought to life through a dramatic presentation uh, the, uh, the tension, you know, and the, the anguish and the, the choices that our leaders had to make in order to lead the people and lead them effectively. I want to point to one scene in the film, mm -hmm. Selma. It was focused on Martin Luther King, and he was in the car with Ralph Abernathy, mm -hmm. and he had just received that call mm -hmm. where they said, if you ain't out of town in three days, mm -hmm. we're going to blow your brains out and mm -hmm. blow up your house. Mm -hmm. And Martin Luther King, for the first time that we had seen in that movie, mm -hmm. uh, revealed that he was scared to death. Mm -hmm. And Ralph Abernathy turned to him and said, Martin, you know, I've been following you, and you gave a speech one time, and I just want to remind you of why I'm following you, what you said, because mm -hmm. I was scared. And he said, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., here's what you told me. Mm -hmm. God ain't brought us this far to leave us. That's right. And Martin Luther King never, ever Baby. backed off after mm -hmm. that. Okay. Well, we have uh, another 
clip I'm hoping that we have queued up right now and show a little bit more of the program. This is Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, and I'm subbing for Bruce Broussard today. Well, they'll bring that in, Mike, when... when uh, well, that gives us uh, a chance to, uh, to point to the works of Martin Luther King. I brought volume one and volume two of the writings. This okay. is the complete collection of the writings of Martin Luther King, Jr. And, you know, we always have, in our, have had in our program, um, the Keep Alive the Dream program is a tribute to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Mm -hmm. Well, that seems like a lot of title to have to put on his name rather than just calling Martin or, or Dr. King. Mm -hmm. But we want everyone to know that not only was he a theologian, mm -hmm. but he also was a scholar. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the three books uh, three of uh, the four books that he had written, um, uh, Stride Toward Fe Freedom, uh, Why We Can't Wait, and the big question, where do we go from here, chaos or community? Mm -hmm. So Martin Luther King was a, a prolific writer, a scholar, as well as a great preacher and leader. Well, that's an interesting uh, take on Reverend Doctor, and one of our presenters this year, the Reverend Dr. Watson, uh, said and specifically asked us to put Reverend in front of her name it was because she said so often people if you say Dr. Watson wants to know where she's coming from are you a psychologist are you a medical doctor right. or you know and they didn't know she's a theologian or a spiritual person is where her degree comes from right uh, so uh, having Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is not a redundant it is a clarification on our exactly. part. And, of course, uh, we were hosted by Reverend Dr. Hardy. Right, so. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. So, but uh, other thoughts about the program this year, uh, Michael, that you think are important to talk about? Well, uh, thanks to Barbara O'Hare, Barbara O'Hare Walker, mm -hmm. uh, we were able to move the program uh, from the Highland Center to its annex for the Voting Rights Act commemoration mm -hmm. down to the Oregon Historical Society where uh, the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. Arun Gandhi, made a presentation to the public. Mm -hmm. So they said if we can't get Muhammad to come to the mountain, mm -hmm. take the mountain to Muhammad. Right. And this is what we uh, had done in uh, penetrating the uh, Oregon Historical Society. And, and there he told an interesting story. I hope I have time to share it. Okay. Uh, he said when he w because it had to do with violence. He said that we commit acts of violence just in our thought pattern about, you know, dissing somebody or having enough of someone or, or having not having a complimentary thing that we can say, you know, because mom used to say, if you can't say something good, don't, don't say, say anything, anything at all. Right. <laughs> um, but he said when he was 17 years old that his father said, come into town with me and drive the car to the shop while I'm at the convention. Mm -hmm. Pick me up at five o'clock. Here's a short list of groceries for your mom. Mm -hmm. He said he had all day. Now, he's in Bombay, India, so think about what he said. He said he decided that afternoon, since he had all day, he would take in a John Wayne double feature. <laughs> and he ended up in the movie house, fell asleep. He woke up. It was, he was late. It was 5.30. He missed his 5 o'clock pickup. His dad was waiting for him and pacing like any good parent would do, wondering what the heck happened. He said, well, what happened, son? His son said, well, I took the car to the shop. It took longer than they had predicted, and so it made me late. He said, well, I just called up to the shop to find out what happened, and they said they hadn't seen you. Mm -hmm. And so he said, uh, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to walk home. He said, well, you can't do that. It's 18 miles. He says, yes, but somewhere along my way of raising you, I went wrong. I left something out mm -hmm. that you would be afraid of your father, that you would lie to your father. And I need to think about what it was, where I failed. Mm -hmm. And he walked home. And, and the punishment for his son wasn't a violent punishment. He just had to follow his father home. While his father walked, he drove the truck behind him at a snail's pace for 18 miles. He said he never lied again. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was a moving story. Yes. So there are other solutions other than violence to, to any issue in Well, he was calling our attention to how do we discipline our children? Mm -hmm. Are we thoughtful about it? Are we careful mm -hmm. about it? Uh, or do we react? rather than respond. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have anger, in, which is really fear, mm -hmm. in, in our hearts with our children? Or are we able to love them mm -hmm. in the way that Jesus loved us, in the way that Martin Luther King loved his people? He was willing to die. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us aren't. What are the other activities that uh, Arun Gandhi participated in on this trip to Portland, and in addition to being the keynote speaker for 
the Dr. King tribute? Well, I know that he had a luncheon at the uh, Multnomah Athletic Club, mm -hmm. and there he met with a rather uh, elite body of mm -hmm. people who otherwise would not have uh, come to Martin Luther, seen the Martin Luther King tribute. Mm -hmm. So he was in at least four different contexts, mm -hmm. one with school children, one with uh, the MAC Club mm -hmm. uh, members, mm -hmm. and uh, one at the Oregon Historical Society, which was for the general public, mm -hmm. and then of course on stage as part of our Keep Alive the Dream production. And because it was our 30th anniversary production, it made it very special to have such a distinguished international perspective offered. Okay, great, great. Um, we had tributes to three individuals as part of the program this year. Uh, as you mentioned, the incomparable Janice Scroggins, pianist supreme, uh, Linda Hornbuckle, one of the best voices in the country. Right. Uh, and then also uh, William Harold Woods, who didn't have a bunch of degrees. He didn't, well, he did sing in the chorus with the, the uh, uh, Bethel, Choir. Bethel, Bethel Choir, Men's Choir, uh, and but he wasn't a soloist or anything like that. But here was a man that we honored because he was representative of the average man right. in that he he took care of his family. Uh, he was a role model for a lot of us who grew up in the neighborhood. He lived to be ninety three years old. He was a man for all seasons. He, for all seasons. He was a, and if you think back about uh, those people who follow the scriptures, know that when Jesus picked his disciples, mm -hmm. he didn't go down to the university and find the, the finest scholars. He picked a fisherman. Mm -hmm. He picked a laborer mm -hmm. and uh, told him that he was going to make them fishers of men. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so he took very pedestrian people and put them in important roles. And Harold Woods, uh, while he wasn't celebrated uh, throughout his lifetime to being a great man of mm -hmm. distinction, he represented all of the labor class, mm -hmm. all particularly all of the railroad men, mm -hmm. who uh, the railroad men and the steel workers and the shipyard workers who basically made up the population of early Portland, the Portland's right. early they black community. They came to Portland to work. To work. To and work. Uh, and he, uh, he worked, uh, like the rest of our fathers, worked uh, two jobs all his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the distinction that uh, Mr. Harold Woods uh, uh, had was that he could do everything. Yeah. He, he could be a plumber. Yeah. He could build a house. He could, he could fix, fix a car. car. I bought my first car from him. <laughs> he could fix a car. I, he I could fix a truck. Yeah. And he worked two jobs and raised eight kids. So mm. he was uh, he was the kind of Renaissance man that we wished we had more of. And so we had three people that we lost in the community so quickly in, in a short span of time. It was great to see the, uh, this particular tribute. And, you know, we had some of the uh, uh, colleagues of uh, Linda and uh, uh, Janice, uh, notably people like uh, uh, Reggie the Houston. Boogie Cat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> he did Norm Sylvester Norm did his Sylvester, thing. Reggie yeah. Houston, uh, LaRonda Steele did a, uh, a, a great arrangement of some numbers. And it was just a great tribute to those great singers. Well, we were happy that uh, Dr. Harriet Adair was living to get her award. Right. But uh, when we knew that we wanted to do three, and we had lost Janice Scroggins, and we had lost Linda Hornbuckle, uh, Harold Woods volunteered to go to heaven mm -hmm. so that we could have one, okay. two, and three. Yes, he That's, did. That is a good way to look at it. <laughs> we'll be back on Oregon Voters Digest. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Hi, we're back to Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, guest host for Bruce Broussard. And uh, Bruce is uh, just out having a great time today. Uh, and I'm honored to be a substitute for him. And my first guest, and only guest today, really is uh, Mr. Michael Chappie Grice, president of World Arts Foundation Incorporated. And we're just recapping for you the 30th annual tribute to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that was held this past January 19th, 2015 at Highland Christian Center. We have a little bit more footage to share with you to just give you a slice of this great program and the performances that took place. For this freedom, a price has sacrifice has been made for these gains. And it's up to you to keep it. It's up to you to fight for the dream. It's up for you to fulfill the dream. It's, it's up for you to pass on the mantle to the next generation. And when you do, the dream will be fulfilled. Thank you very much. Janice Marie Scroggins, July 17, 1955, May 27, 2014. Preserving tradition, history, and life. Janice began performing as a pianist at the age of three. The story that I was told is that um, after I was born, I cried all the time until someone said they saw me crying and looking at the piano. And then they put me up there on the piano stool and I placed my hands on the keys and I stopped crying. And um, so it's just something I wanted. Janice credits several artists, including Thera Memory, Mel Brown, and Norman Sylvester for her success. Thera Memory. Oh, look. <laughs> Sorry. I've only been with him since I've been here. He was the first musician I met when I got to town in 1979, and I've been with him um, throughout that time. It's certain people that you have in your life that um, you call them loves of your life. And he's one. Obo Adu was one. You know, plus all my kids are one, but he, he's a love of my life. Yeah. One, one person I was playing with said that, they could say, God, you started playing when you were two. Well, that's your first language. So um, it is a pure blessing. And um, it's, I, well, I use it for everything. It's my, my part of my breath. And, and it's like Rhonda said, it's our makeup. It's, it's, a, it's our DNA. It's, it's a part of that. Um, um, just like water and nutrition and everything else, um, it's, we, we, need, we need to do this. And we're blessed when we do it, and we're blessed by it. And it's meditation, prayer, centering, all of those things.
top of that, my best friend got life for a charge, which is ironic, Mr. Obama. I said my best friend just got life for a charge, which is ironic, because we both might die with these bars. Hey everybody, Voters Digest, Donnie Adair, your guest host, and we're back. And we're just reviewing the Martin Luther King tribute, the 30th annual of the World Arts Foundation Incorporated, which took place this past January 19th. We want to thank uh, Bobby Pilata, uh, Beyond the Eye Video, for all of the video shot on that program that was aired today. He did such a wonderful job. And, and Michael, we really had... Uh, great support from Portland Cable, uh, Portland Community Media, uh, and just a host of technicians, cable radio, and so forth that made this program possible. Absolutely. And we get a chance to thank the, the Portland Police, led by Larry O'Day, who had uh, his uh, lieutenants and officers uh, there to chiefs. assistant chiefs uh, helping to support uh, the program uh, visibly. Yeah. And uh, not only did it give a focus of security, but it demonstrated a commitment on their part uh, to support the community. We're going to be doing more uh, with him in the future. And there, he did a very timely Green Room interview for us that we hope to air. It'll be featured and, in our rebroadcast. In our rebroadcast. So, uh, but in kind of closing, uh, Michael, just share with me anything else that you want to say about this wonderful 30th annual tribute that we did. Well, I think we haven't said enough about, and we could do a whole program on the contributions of Mr. Ken Berry. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, he's a friend of ours, but uh, that doesn't doesn't matter quite as much as what he has contributed that people do not know, mm -hmm. both as an educator and as a video producer and as a, a friend and a fan of uh, Facebook. I know many people follow his work. Uh, mm -hmm. He celebrates uh, almost everything when people uh, are achieving it. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't hold back. He's a very generous guy. But that goes the same for all our entire production team. You know, when we started, we we thought our job was to please the audience. Mm -hmm. And then we decided that our job was to try to please the, uh, uh, the, artists, uh, the artists who came. Mm -hmm. First the audience, and then the artists. If we can please the artists, they'll take care of the audience. Mm -hmm. And now we know that as we love one another on the mm -hmm. production team, as we make sure that everybody does their job, then we see the result. And uh, we're blessed that we did it for 30 years, uh, virtually nonstop. Well, thank you for sharing your time with us today in the recap of this tribute, and I look forward to working with you on future programs. Uh, anything on the horizon for World Arts that we need to look for this spring? Well, we're going to continue to celebrate musicians. We're going to continue to celebrate artists. And our motto is uh, working hard at the intersection of education and the arts. So we'll be doing an architecture project this summer, a summer youth employment program that's going to involve Alberta Street and World Arts Foundation, Inc., and a new role in writing curriculum uh, for our school students. Well, thank you very much. All right, Donnie Adair. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, land and water conservation and also talk about the, more about the great outdoors. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, guest host for Mr. Bruce Broussard today. And we want to close out the program today introducing some things we're going to talk about in the future. Bruce has asked me to come back over the next couple of two or three weeks to talk about some environmental concerns from the angle or the perspective of the hunter and fisherman. I'm president of African American Hunting Association and we've been trying to get African Americans, other people of color and, and urban folks interested in hunting, shooting, fishing and other outdoor recreation. As part of that, this year we're talking more about conservation, specifically the Land Water Conservation Act which has been around for 50 years. It's a program that reinvests a small part of offshore oil and gas into conserving onshore land and water resources. And Oregon has gotten about $300 million over the 50 years uh, of projects funded. Uh, and some of these, about $250 million were Oregon projects and a, another uh, 50 million or so were projects that jointly uh, assisted Oregon, Washington, or Oregon, Idaho. They were multi-state types of, of projects. So the kind of projects that, and uh, places uh, where these funds were used include the Mount Hood National Forest or Columbia River Gorge, Tualatin National Wildlife, but it is not only rural sites, uh, uh, sites within the community, the local communities and within cities like in Portland, Delta Park, uh, Pier Park, Fernhill Park, Columbia Park, and more have received funding for projects through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. The importance of looking at this right now is that this legislation, this federal legislation, will end in September of this year. And so we want to make sure that we let all of our uh, legislators know that uh, we want to see full funding for a new Land and Water Conservation Act. And, and one of the ways we've been doing that is to uh, get signatures on letters of support. We did that on Martin Luther King Day and got letters of support signed, uh, which will go to uh, Senator Merkley and Senator Wyden, who's been very uh, much supportive of this act and may even be one of the leaders that will introduce the new act in Congress. So we've got a piece on the land and water conservation that we want to roll in to give you an idea of this very important topic. So, number one, you want to know my position on the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I will be a very, very strong supporter of it. So, I'm going to do everything I can to try to build support on the other side of the aisle for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I'm not going to go calling people names and all the rest, because that's not my style. My style is to try to see if we can get people to come together. And I do think that you've given me a lot of good arguments. I mean, the kind of points that the gentleman made with respect to jobs that are locally driven and the economic multiplier that, you know, comes about. This is not Washington, D.C. telling Mike what to do about his, you know, fishing, you know, business. This is him as a private business person showing that you can give people a considerable amount of pleasure and he can run a successful business that also sparks jobs in a variety of other kinds of areas.
want to thank the backcountry uh, outfitters and hunters for that little piece that kind of introduces uh, Land and Water uh, Conservation Act and, and why it's so important. And again, I'm going to be coming back talking to you about that uh, with Bruce as we talk more about African American Hunting Association and other groups that are focusing on outdoor recreation for people of color. Also on the horizon and something we're going to be talking about when I come back is a new book that's imminent that's, that I've got coming out called From the City to the Woods. And this book is going to detail a black family's hunting experience. And uh, like many of you who might be watching now, I grew up in an urban environment right here in Portland, Oregon, and I didn't get involved in shooting or hunting as a kid, but I did learn how to uh, fish from my grandfather and my uncle. And then later on, I began to hunt. Uh, oddly enough, when I went to college at the University of Oregon in Eugene, I began to hang with these brothers who were the Eugene chapter of the Black Panther Party, and they took me out on hunting adventures, and we harvested deer and took them to low-income families. I, we actually, uh, I learned how to process wild game and and uh, heart and uh, butcher it and all that kind of stuff from them and so i i had a great interest in hunting so i've got some pictures from the book that i want to share with you now and just uh, tell you about what these slides show as far as a black family's experience in hunting can we have that first picture maybe all right, this is a, a young man that we hope to get on the show with us. His name is Dante Zuniga West. He's out of uh, the Eugene area. And this is a bear that was killed in 2014. Was actually, uh, he's got an article in Bear Hunting Magazine, November, December issue. He's a great young up-and-coming outdoor writer who writes for two publications in Eugene. But even more than that, he's a great young hunter. Uh, and he, along with his family, are doing some articles. His wife shot her first deer with a muzzleloader also last fall during the hunting season. Next slide. Uh, now, this, again, this is that University of Oregon connection. Years ago, I started hunting at the University of Oregon when I was attending there. And this is my son, Donnell, who uh, will be on the show with us in a couple of weeks to talk about his hunting journey. And he's part of the information and story that I share in the book. This is his first buck, a blacktail buck in the McKenzie unit there close to Eugene. I sent him down there to study. What does he do? He finds hunting buddies, and he went out, and this was his first deer that he harvested uh, approximately uh, about six, seven years ago. Uh, so uh, I'm really proud of him, and he's become an expert, and he's going to come talk to us on the show. Can I have the next one slide, please? All right, this is, uh, when I talk about a black family's journal, uh, journey into hunting or our experience, uh, one of the things uh, that many African Americans face is it's hard to find hunting partners. And one of the things that I did, and I talk about it in my book, upcoming book, From the City to the Woods, is that you have to make your own sometimes. And when these guys right there, my sons, Kenny on the left, Donnell on the right, they uh, were 11 and 12. I took them to hunter education, and I went with them to hunter education, and we went through that process. I also became a master hunter through the state's education program, and uh, we began hunting. So I started them really early. You saw in that last uh, scene, Donnell, with his first buck. Well, this is him 12 years old with some of his first ducks that he shot. Next slide, please. All right, so we've been taking out kids since 2008 to teach them how to shoot, target shoot, as well as getting them interested in hunting. This was one of our first programs uh, out at the Portland Gun Club, and we had some youth that we took out there, and gun club members and instructors helped them to learn how to shoot uh, trap uh, with shotguns, 12-gauge and 20-gauge shotguns, and they just had a blast 
man, and uh, and some of them are still uh, shooting now. And in the next slide, I think we have uh, this is uh, uh, my granddaughter, my 23 year old granddaughter. She or 24 now, I should say. Uh, we want to encourage women to think about shooting, target shooting, and also to get into the sport of hunting. And as you can see there, she's left-handed like her granddad, has pretty good uh, form as well, but has been out with us numerous times. And it brings up the point that uh, all of my kids and grandkids grow up, and they have to learn how to shoot. Even if they don't return to it, they get exposed to it, but most of them ended up uh, liking it. Got a couple more slides for you real quickly. Okay, this is, you know, it's not all about just target practice and big game. Sometimes small game is out there. This is a, a hen turkey that I took down in Eugene on an, what you call an emergency hunt for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife where some birds, a flock of birds was a nuisance to a resident down outside of Eugene, south of Eugene, out the Lorraine Highway there. And uh, I've gotten like five or six birds over the last three years. These turkeys do taste really, really good. Uh, some really good uh, table fare with wild game in the state of Oregon. And Oregon's become a great state to, to hunt turkeys in. May have a slide or two more. We'd like to see those. Okay, again, getting the kids out, uh, and especially young ladies there. Uh, Carla Williams is the young lady seated next to me, uh, a niece, and we want to get them out. So we'll be talking more about this in the upcoming shows uh, and uh, showing you not only pictures but having some guests on to talk about their hunting experience here on Oregon Voters Digest where we present uh, important topics and interesting topics to our community. Bruce Broussard is going to be back with you next week and... Uh, it's going to be a great show that he'll have for you next week, and uh, he'll, um, I'll be back with him in a couple of weeks after that. You've been watching Oregon Voters Digest. Uh, I'm your host, Donnie Adair, guest host today for Bruce Broussard, and we'll see you next week. Two minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm told I have two more minutes. Okay. Um, uh, again, t uh, talking a little bit about the, the book, um, we hope to have it released over in the next uh, uh, three months or so, and it's, there's been a lot of call for it. The, uh, what we used to determine what to put in the book was uh, questions and information uh, that came to us through our website, which is AfricanAmericanHuntingAssociation.com. And also through our Facebook page, African American Hunting Association on Facebook. And so we were answering the questions that come up, particularly the ones that are unique to people, to African Americans and people of color. Because people of color want to know, is it safe to go out and do the woods and hunt? Is it safe to hike? Is it safe to get out there and try your hand at outdoor photography? Uh, not only from animals, but sometimes from other people and groups that you might encounter. And uh, I've written the book to tell you, yes, it is very safe for you to go out if you, especially if you're going to hunt and, and fish and those kinds of things, educate yourself and have the right tools and go with friends. And, and you'll enjoy a lot of camaraderie and a lot of good table fare from your hunting and your fishing experiences. And also, you'll end up with a lot of great memories by getting into the outdoors. And it's certainly a lot different than the relaxation and recreation that you have in the city, where we're in the cement jungle and we're playing with our Xbox and we're doing a lot of things with our fingers rather than getting out and doing the things uh, that will make us healthy and have a long, wonderful life. So... Look forward to our talk about the outdoors, more about the Land Water Conservation Fund, and other important federal legislation on Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, and it's been a pleasure to be your host.